research, this is the last study that I'm going to talk about, um, is on saccadic eye movements. So I don't know if everybody knows what that is. It's, uh, if you don't, that's totally fine. Um, saccadic eye movements are just basically um, coordinated movements of the eyes. So basically, we're doing it all the time. Our eyes are constantly scanning the environment, moving back in here. I just saw that person walk out and looked back over here, and it didn't really interrupt my, my thinking and my train of thought. We're constantly doing this. We're seeing things in our periphery, and our eyes are constantly moving. And our eyes are an extension of our brain, and they originally start as developing as part of our brain and you know really are an extension of the frontal lobe so it's it's a really to measure saccadic eye movements you're really measuring um brain function so we have um and there's a, there's an overlap in the brain structures that are affected by pain and alcohol exposure and those involved in saccadic eye movements things like the prefrontal cortex the caudate the thalamus and the cerebellum interestingly i just told you in our study we didn't find the caudate to be impaired but i told you that a lot of other studies do find that um, so, there, it's a really neat um, marker of brain function that you can measure. And there's actually like people that spend their lives studying saccadic eye movements. It's not actually that hard to measure. So, um, one individual, James Reynolds, um, who's at Queen's University, who I work with, um, had met this guy at his university that studies saccadic eye movements, and they thought, wow, look, look at this in kids with FASD. Again, it's just a lot of these ideas just kind of come and nobody's really done it, let's see if there's something going on here. And they really, really um, stepped on something really interesting with the saccadic eye movements. So um, we participated in one of their studies. We were a site in a study where we collected saccadic eye movement data. So basically, they're non-invasive. So it's really easy measure for children. All they're presented with is a computer screen, and they, I'll go over the task in a minute, but they have to follow different targets on a computer screen. And then they just wear these glasses that record, like, their eye movements and it records it into a computer screen and their reaction time and everything. It's really easy. And the kids, like, they don't um, hate it. They kind of like these kind of tasks. They think it's neat to get over these classes, look at these things, and little they know we're actually measuring their eye movements. So basically, um, Dr. Reynolds, James Reynolds, he's developed two types of tasks to measure these eye movements. And I'll just quickly, quickly run through them. So um, the pro psychate task is they're, they're presented with a green dot on the screen. And then they're told, that another dot is going to, a white dot is going to appear to either the left or the right side, and they're supposed to look towards it once it appears. Pretty easy. Here's the green dot, look towards the, the, the white one that's going to come up. So they either look that way or that way is to where it comes up. So, and then in the first condition, the white dot appears before the green dot disappears, and in the second condition, there's a 200 millisecond gap between when, which is very small which is between when this dot disappears and that one appears. So there's a gap between it appears. So that's the, the standard task. And then there's the anti-saccade task, which is more related to inhibition. So here's the dot. Now they're told, after they've done this one, they're told, now when the other dot appears, you have to look in the other way. So something's going to flash right here, and you're supposed to look in the other way. You can imagine how that takes a coordinated control in your brain to be able to do that. Okay, and so that's the anti saccade task, and then there's um, the overlap and the gap condition. So I'm not, I won't go into too much detail on this, but this is one of his slides from his first study on this that they published, the first study ever on this um, that they published in 2007. We weren't part of this project, um, but I asked James and he gave me this slide to show you guys. This is really neat. So what happens in control children? Okay, so this is kind of um, their eye tracking. This is how they're moving their eyes, and this is when the, the second dot appears. This is in the anti-saccade task, which is the hardest task where they have to look away. So um, the, the dot appears over here, and so they're looking. A few kids make the mistake and look at it, but almost all the other kids look the other way. So this shows they're looking the other way, and this is their reaction time. This is the time, okay? But a couple of kids make a mistake, but almost all of them are able to not look at the dot. I think that would be pretty hard but they're, they're able to do it. They wanted to try this also with kids with ADHD, and I haven't actually talked too much about ADHD today, but we know there's a huge overlap between FASD and ADHD, that um, upwards of 60 to 80% of kids with FASD also have an ADHD diagnosis, whether or not the ADHD is really kind of part of the difficulties they have with FASD or whether or not it's a separate diagnosis is debatable, but Either way, you have to have difficulty with the impulsivity, hyperactivity, um, and inhibition. So, 
So they wanted to look at kids with only ADHD to see how they would perform, because it's really important if we can differentiate kids with ADHD with kids from FASD. So this is the ADHD kids. So what do they do? Well, they, first of all, they actually start looking sooner than the controls. It's almost like they anticipate it. Um, they start looking sooner than the controls. They have problems with inhibition. We know that about ADHD, right? Many of them look towards the target, which they're not supposed to. That would be an inhibitory deficit, classic of ADHD. But then many of them, they correct it. They say, okay, well, that wasn't supposed to do that. I knew that. I'm going to look back here where I was supposed to look. They do okay, but they still definitely have a lot of errors. Um, but their reaction time is pretty similar to controls. Now, FASD is pretty interesting. First of all, they don't react. That is the slower processing speed, okay? They don't react right away. And I mean, even though this is milliseconds, this is a coordinated movement of your eyes, which is a direct extension of your brain. So their brains, this is a direct evidence, their brains are not responding as fast. This is not a voluntary kind of, you know, it's, it, it's the kind of eye movements are very automatic kind of processes. So they don't react for this amount of time, which however many milliseconds it is, is still a significantly later than kids with ADHD and control children. And then when they do react, they are all over the place. A bunch look to the target, some, some don't. Some correct it after they look to the target, others don't. They still stay looking down there, but they're all over the place. And I think this figure is just so compelling. It really shows um, the differences between the groups. And, and the difference between ADHD and FASD is very compelling here. And it's really clear. Whereas, you know, in the classroom and when we're working with these individuals, it may be hard to kind of tease apart some of these things. But with looking at these types of measures, we can. It's pretty interesting. So that's the Kataguay movement. So they're doing this research. Um, the next step was a multi-phase, or a multi -site. this is their first study, and then there was a multi-site study that was done all across Canada, because they wanted to look at this across hundreds of kids across Canada. So we were part of that study from the Glen Mills Hospital, and the results just kind of confirmed the same thing. So in the multi-site study, we see um, significantly longer reaction times in FASD, and we see significantly more errors in both the pro saccade task, the easiest task, and the anti saccade task. But the differences in the anti saccade task are even bigger. <coughs> the errors and whatnot. So um, they're looking at um, different ways that they can use this eye tracking and potentially for screening for FASD and whatnot. So in summary, from this research, we see significant deficits in the eye movement control. Um, which confirmed the, 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 the findings of that first pilot figure that I showed you. Um, there was no interaction between age and group here, so um, the deficits can't necessarily be explained by just a, a general developmental delay. And, and FASD, it's something related to how they're slower processing things in the brains, and I think that that really um, kind of helps it hit home. So they're now looking at the saccadic eye movement research um, as whether or not it could be a, a potential screening tool or, or biomarker for FASD because we're able to document these pretty specific group differences and um, we don't have a lot of good screeners for FASD out there. So there is potential for it. It's still being used in research. It's definitely not used um, diagnostically. This would never replace the whole neuropsych evaluation and, and workup that a doctor would do for the diagnosis, but it may help you identify children that um, need to get in for testing sooner or later or whatnot. So I, I think that James did bring the psychotic eye movement research to BC as well. I believe that there was a site in BC that was part of that last study. So um, it's pretty interesting stuff.